Hey, what's up guys? My name is Eternal and welcome back to my OpenGL series. So, last time we talked about maths and we started getting into maths and all the math-like topics that will come in the future in this, in this OpenGL series and in your graphics programming journey. Today we're going to be specifically focusing on one small part of that, which is projection. Projection is one of the biggest actual things that we need to solve when it comes to rendering graphics on the screen. It's part of the transformation pipeline, which we will continue to explore over the coming weeks. But today I just want to focus on projection and this is not going to be a super long episode because I don't want to overcomplicate this for you and have you scratching your head. We're not going to talk too much about the technical details and how the maths works because that is completely relevant for 99% of cases. I know that there are probably a bunch of you interested in how it actually works so that you can kind of write your own version of OpenGL from scratch or something. Well, we might cover that in the, in the future. But today, practically speaking, what is projection in OpenGL? How does it work and why do we use it? So to put it simply, projection is just how we go from having some kind of arbitrary coordinate system in our 3D world or 2D world, doesn't matter. I mean, 2D worlds are really 3D anyway, as far as OpenGL is concerned. It's how we go from having coordinates or vertex positions in that space to being able to somehow map them to our window where we're actually rendering on our computer screen. So we have to project them somehow onto this 2D surface. You might have this massive 3D world with hills and terrain and characters and all of that, which in the end obviously just boils down to a bunch of triangles, which are made up of vertex positions. But in the end, that 3D world has to somehow be rendered onto our 2D monitor and into our window. That is what projection is. It is essentially the maths that converts all of those 3D points in space into something that is in a 2D kind of window. That is what projection is. So forget everything you know about projection or whatever, that's all it is. It is as simple as that. Now, what do I mean by convert into positions? What does that even mean? The actual transformation that happens with a projection matrix, which we kind of talked about last time in a maths video and we will touch on today as well, is we just convert all of those positions that we have into something called normalized device coordinates, which is basically some kind of normalized space that we can then map to our window. Now, a normalized space means that literally a coordinate system between negative one and one in every axis, X, Y, and Z, right? So what I'm saying is that picture that you have a window does not matter, resolution does not matter at this rate, doesn't matter what size your window is. All that we know is that the left side of our window, let's just say we're rendering full screen. So the left side will be negative one. The right side will be positive one. The bottom will be negative one and the top will be positive one. Let's not worry too much about Z at this point because that's not as important to visualize as X and Y. So that's it. We have our computer monitor. We have our window open where we're actually rendering all of our graphics. And that is between negative one and one. That is how we, that, that is the space that we need to have all of our vertex positions in so that we can actually start rasterizing stuff onto the screen. However, what we have is like this 3D world or maybe this 2D object somewhere on our screen and we need to convert it into that space. That's what a projection matrix does. And in fact, up until really last episode, we've just, we have not been using a projection matrix, which is why you probably heard me say that our space is between negative one and one. In other words, when we actually made that Cherno logo in the textures video, as an example, we plotted that geometry, like the vertex positions that we actually used there had to be between negative one and one. And I think I wrote something like negative 0.5 to positive 0.5 or something like that. Because without a projection matrix, we have nothing to, con we, we don't have an actual matrix to convert our vertex positions into that normalized device kind of coordinate space. So we have to provide it initially. Because if we don't, if we're gonna be well outside of that, that coordinate space, then we're not gonna see anything on the screen because as far as the screen is concerned, as far as what actually gets rendered onto our window, that has to be between negative one and one, it has to be. But it's a bit difficult for us to deal with something that's just constantly negative one to one. I mean, as an example, let's just say we're rendering a square, but our window is not square, it's four by three or it's 16 by nine. We can't just, I mean, we could theoretically do all the maths every time we calculate vertex positions and I guess keep doing the maths every time so that we do get a square, but wouldn't it be easier to just kind of be able to say, okay, well, how about the left side of our screen maybe is zero, the right side of our screen is width. So maybe my 
the, my window is 1280 by 720. So let's just say that the left side is zero, right side is 1280. And I can render anywhere in between there. And then we'll worry about the maths of actually converting that into negative one to one later. So that is essentially what a projection can do for you. It lets you decide what your coordinate space is so that you can render objects however you like, whether they be inside the space, maybe they are outside of the screen because we're dealing with some kind of camera system that only shows the scene partially. That's a projection lets us do all of that. And for 3D, it's especially important because if you think about what a 3D scene looks like, it's not just as simple as kind of converting your projection from negative one to one and like, well, scaling it rather from a value, from a large kind of value into negative one to one. So as that example that I just gave from zero to 1280 is my kind of projection matrix, I'm scaling that down into something that is negative one to one. That's might seem to you like, oh, that's easy. You know, I'll just divide this by like 1280 and like multiply it by two or whatever, subtract one, you know, easy, right? Done. But if you think about a perspective projection, which is what is typically used in a 3D world. If you just take a photo of something and you take a look at objects, objects that are further away actually become smaller. They'd be smaller in the photograph, right? And you don't even have to take a photo for this. You can just look with your own eyes and you can see, huh, that, you know, I can, that, you know, mountain over there is really just this big from here because of the way that perspective works, because objects that are further away tend to look smaller. That is also a, an actual projection that needs to be applied if you're dealing with a 3D scene. And that's what a projection matrix can do. It will essentially look at the Z value and say, okay, well, objects with a larger Z value, if you use a coordinate system where positive Z is like far, those objects or those vertices with a lower, with a higher Z value will actually end up being closer to the middle of the camera, which essentially will just make them smaller. So that's really important as well. And when we get into 3D stuff, you'll see how important a perspective projection is. But anyway, if we just take a look at this little PowerPoint slide that I prepared here, we have two different main types of projection here. We have orthographic projection and perspective projection. So orthographic projection is usually used for 2D rendering. Now, when I say usually, keep in mind, first of all, whilst orthographic is usually used for 2D, it's not always used for 2D. It's totally fine to use orthographic th for 3D. That's actually done quite commonly because it presents a slightly different view that might be useful for something like a level editor or a 3D modeling program. Uh, perspective is usually used for 3D, but uh, I mean, everything is 3D anyway because there is the concept of Z. So if you're thinking of a 2D platformer, that might actually be using a perspective projection because there might be elements further away. If you look at a game such as Rayman, like the new Rayman games, they have that concept of depth, even though you can really only move on what is mostly kind of a 2D plane, a 2D axis. So don't take these as like, okay, perspective 3D, orthographic 2D. Not true, it can be used in both cases, but usually when we think of an orthographic projection, we think of rendering something like UI or something maybe a 2D game or something like that. Whereas when we, think, when we think of perspective, we think of like a first person shooter or something like that, where we actually have a 3D world that we're rendering, but that's not necessarily all they're used for. Anyway, what we see over here with this orthographic projection is that objects that are further away are not actually, they don't get smaller like they do with perspective. You can see these cubes, they look like they're further away because they're smaller and our eyes are used to that because that's how we see in the real world. Whereas these two cubes here, they're the same distance. I mean, for all intents and purposes, what you see in these two diagrams that I just <laughs> literally made in five seconds in PowerPoint using the shapes thing. Anyway, they're awful, I know. Um, these things that are further away, they have the same vertex positions as these ones here. It's just that these are using orthographic projection and these are using perspective projection because you know, these cubes do have the same width, the same height, the same depth, all of that, right? They just happen to be at a further Z value. And the perspective projection math that actually goes on when we multiply these vertices with our projection matrix, that is what makes them smaller because they have a high Z value. But at the end of the day, every single vertex position of all of these cubes gets mapped into a space that is between negative one and one. And that's what the normalized device coordinates are. 
there are space that are between kind of negative one and one. Anything that is outside of that, so for example, if I have a vertex that ends up being calculated to be negative two, that does not get rendered. It gets culled because it's outside of our actual view. It's outside of our frustum. Now, we're definitely gonna talk more about, you know, these projections as we start to use them, but let's take a look at them in our code base. If I go back to my OpenGL code, over here, I have uh, this projection matrix that I'm creating. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying I have an orthographic projection between negative two and two in X and negative 1.5 and positive 1.5 in Y. And then this is just the Z, the near and far. So we're not gonna worry too much about that for now. Anything that I render, any vertex position, these are my vertex positions, any vertex position that lies outside of this, these bounds will not appear because this is the leftmost X bound this is the rightmost x bound. So if I was to adjust any of these x coordinates to be say negative 2.5 or positive five or positive 100, they're not actually going to render because that is my view. That is all that I see. And at the end of the day, this orthographic projection when multiplied with these vertex positions is going to convert them to be in that negative one to one space. So as an example, since we have chosen negative two to two, that means that zero is in fact the center, the middle of our actual screen. If I have a vertex at negative 0.5, you can tell that that's kind of from the middle, it's a quarter of the way towards the leftmost bound because 0.5 is a quarter of two. So since this orthographic matrix is going to convert this position to be between negative one and one, then what is a quarter between zero and negative one? It's 0 0.25. So we can just tell just by eyeballing this because this, this projection matrix is so simple that this will become 0 0.25 on our actual screen. And if we do hit F5, it'll be a little bit hard to tell because I believe we are actually rendering a texture which is like partially transparent. In fact, yeah, I'm just gonna get rid of that. If I go to my shader, I'm just going to make it so that we output, instead of outputting the texture color, we're just gonna output white. So just VEC41. And if we look at this now, you can see that if you kind of eyeball this, you know, this is the center of the screen here. And this, this leftmost kind of edge that we have from our square is a quarter of the way to the left because it becomes 0 0.25 where this, or negative 0 0.25, where this is negative one. Hopefully this maths is kind of making sense to you. I don't really want to dive in and start drawing diagrams or anything because it's not really that useful to know this in practice. You just have to know that what the projection matrix does is it converts it into that normalized kind of device coordinate space of negative one to one. That's really all that's happening. It's a, just a simple maths operation. There's nothing too fancy about projection matrices. If we go over here and what I'm actually going to do is in my application, I'm going to, instead of drawing this at, at 640 by 480. I'm gonna convert this to be 960 by 540. And what I'm going to do now, well, let's just hit a five and see what happens. Remember, we still have the same projection matrix. So it still kind of looks the same. I mean, it looks stretched out because we've changed the resolution of our window, but kept the projection matrix the same. It's no longer, our square is no longer a square. It's kind of a rectangle. If we go back to our orthographic projection, let's play a little bit around with this. So what I'm going to do is what I mentioned earlier, in my example, which is just changing it to be basically in pixel space, so a one-to-one -one pixel mapping. So to do that, I'm gonna make zero my leftmost edge, 960 my rightmost edge, because that's the horizontal resolution. I'm then going to make uh, zero my bottom and 540 my top. And I guess I will have to make this a float because this is a bit sad. Okay, cool, so let's hit F5. All right, cool, so we don't see anything at all. And that would be because, well, I mean, we do, it's just hard to see because of course, if we are in pixel space, then this square is one by one pixel, which is obviously one pixel, which is tiny. So what we can do is just boost this. So I might just set this to be like 10.5 instead of 0 0.5. I'll just add a one here just to keep it simple still. And if we hit F5, you can now kind of begin to see it, but it's over here in the bottom left because what we've done, of course, is we've made the bottom, the like our zero comma zero coordinate to be the bottom left of our window. So if we scroll back up, what I'm going to do is just rewrite this. I was just gonna modify it, but let's just rewrite it. Let's make this a hundred 
by uh, well we'll we'll start at a hundred by a hundred, and then I think we go anti-clockwise. It kind of looks like we are going clockwise. Give me a second here. Okay, cool. So we'll just say a hundred by a hundred. Then we go uh, anti-clockwise to the right. So we'll say 200 by still 100. And I'll just get rid of these 0.5s. And then we'll say 200 again for X and 100 here. And then this will become 200, 200. Okay, so if we hit a five now with these new coordinates that we have here, we should see a square somewhere and yes we do and if I go back to my shader and I change this to be a to be our actual texture then you can see we get this rendering here so what we've done here is you can see that really we've just played with the coordinate system a little bit we've changed our projection matrix to be between 0 and 960 for x 0 and 540 for y so essentially we've changed we've changed it to be per pixel based on our, on the resolution of our window and then because of that, we've had to adjust the positions of our geometry to actually be in that space. So rather than be like negative 0.5, positive 0.5, we've actually had to, ch had to change them to be something a bit bigger, like 100 and 200 and all of that, because now we've redefined what space we actually define our vertex positions in. But at the end of the day, what happens is these vertex positions get multiplied with our matrix and that is what converts them back into being negative 0.5 by 0.5. Let's take a look at another example. So just to make this absolutely clear, we have this 100 by 100. What I'm going to do is I'll keep my projection matrix, but I'll make a GLM VEC4 and I'll call this VP, vertex position. And I'll just create a VEC4 here that has the coordinate 100 by 100 and then 0, 1. Okay, so we don't have a Z coordinate and for, one, and for W we're just gonna specify one. What I'm going to do then is type in GLM VEC4 result equals proj times VP. So I'm actually doing that multiplication myself right here on the CPU just to see what the result is so, so that we can actually see. Now remember what I said. What we're doing here is this projection matrix is supposed to take our coordinate, our vertex position, and convert it into a space that is between negative 1 and 1. So if I hit F5 and I take a look at this, if we look at our actual projection matrix, it looks a bit wild. I mean, this is like 0 0.002, whatever. We don't really need to look at that. Uh, our vertex position is of course 100, 100, 0, and 1. If I hit F10 here to do this calculation, take a look at our result. Now, it might be a little bit hard to see. Um, I'll really tell if it's worked or not, but you can see that at the X and Y, Z of course was always 0, W is gonna remain 1, but X and Y have changed from being 100, 100 to negative 0.79, and negative 0.62. If we go to, so remember those two values, 0 point, negative 0 0.79 and ne negative 0 0.62. If we look at this, and we take a look at the, the bottom leftmost coordinate, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Like this, if we were to change our mapping to not use a projection matrix anymore, and we had negative one to one, you could kind of imagine this as being around 70% of the way to there from the middle, right? So what it's done clearly is it has converted our 100 by 100 to be in that negative one to one space. And that is what projection does in both 2D and 3D. So in other words, orthographic or perspective, again, nothing to do with 2D or 3D, it's just what people commonly associate them with. So in perspective and orthographic projection, it doesn't matter, the same thing happens. All you're doing is you're telling your computer how to convert from whatever space you're currently dealing it with, which is something that you define yourself, to that negative one-to-one -one normalized device coordinate space. And that is all there is to projection in OpenGL. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit the like button. You can also help support this series by going over to patreon.com forward slash the channel. Let me know what you think of these kind of more technical videos. On one hand, I really like making them because I think that like, People like me probably would be interested to, I wish like someone explained it as simple as I hopefully did here today when I was learning this kind of stuff. But on the other hand, I know that some of you probably wanna see more things on the screen and wanna see more progress and wanna to get to the fun stuff. So let me know what your thoughts are on this, if you're okay with this, if you want me to do more practical things and maybe come back and do, do the theory later. But either way, you can help support the series by going to Patreon and forward slash the channel. Huge thank you to all the patrons who make these videos possible would not be here without you guys so thank you so much 
I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.